Welcome to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel is a ministry that's dedicated to speaking the gospel out of every corner of Scripture. In Luke 24, Jesus told his disciples that every part of the Bible was about him. So each week, hosts David and Seth work through a passage of Scripture to see how it's all about Jesus and his good news. Let's jump in. Well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Really, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to be with you. Seth, how are you? Doing well. Yeah. I am ready to end the book of Micah and talk about um, some of the, probably the most famous, but I loved this song from John Foreman yes. called Equally Skilled Yes, back in, I guess, college is when I listened to it. Same. And it was, John Foreman and this song was one of my favorite songs all throughout college, and it's yep. based off the prayer in Micah 7. Yep. Um, so I'm just really excited to yep. talk about that. I mean, if you've tuned in today, and this is the only thing you take away... You should listen never, to that song. You've never heard this song. You're welcome. <laughs> John Foreman, equally skilled. So good. Go listen. I mean, pause the podcast. Yeah. Go listen to that Go song. Listen to, I think I listened to it a dozen times as I was like oh, yeah. studying through it's the book of Micah. so God. good. So anyway, I, I weep like every time. Uh, okay. When that keychain comes in. Mm. Anyway. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, we are finishing Micah. Yeah. Like we've said before, it's a series of three court cases. We're now in the third court case. Um, and God calls to, the mountains. Yeah. He's going to call some witnesses against Israel. And he calls the mountains as witnesses. <laughs> Those must have been big witness boxes. Very large witness boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. For th- I mean, like, it's like the whole earth is a witness it's box. Like, whoa. It's like really big. Yeah. Is there anything else we need to set up a week of people being out of Micah? Ah. That would be helpful. Yes. Diving back in. So the book of Micah is addressing the twin problems of corrupt leaders within Israel and the encroaching Assyrian superpower at their front doors. Yeah. And God will save Israel by getting rid and judging the corrupt leaders of Israel instituting a new leader in its place, a shepherd leader, a shepherd king Mm -hmm. who will judge with equity, but also lead Israel out to destroy evil and set themselves up as a new nation where all nations can come and receive justice. Yeah. That's the prophecies of the book of Micah. Right. And and the only way for them to get to the blessing and the mountain being raised up is to go into exile, into death, to be destroyed. Yes. They must... the, uh, they must first be destroyed in order for them to be raised. Yeah, this coming kingdom comes after judgment, after yeah. death for yeah. their for their sins. Judgment after or salvation after judgment. That's yeah. what it is. Okay. Yeah. Great. So court case number three. Mm-hmm. Again, third time he calls uh Israel to hear, to listen. Yeah. And then he asks the mountain to arise and plead their case. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um so and The idea here is that the mountains are these objective, Mm. long-standing observers to God's covenant and God's uh, grace towards Israel. Yeah, it's a it's a really it's a much better way of saying, man, if these walls could talk. Yeah, it's that. Yes, that's exactly what it is. They've been watching. What's they've been been watching? And he says, "Hey, mountains, tell us what's been happening." The mountains were there, and he mentions a whole bunch of things the mountains saw. The mountains were there when God liberated Israel from Egypt. Mm -hmm. The mountains saw when God gave them the leaders of uh, Moses, Moses Aaron, and and Miriam. And Miriam, which is funny. Miriam didn't feel like that big of a character in the Exodus story, but she is here because I think because she was one of the first prophetesses. Yeah, she was. Yeah. And so, anyway, I just, that was. A, yeah. a new piece, of, a new little piece of biblical imaginative fodder yes, in my mind. Absolutely. The mounds also saw um, how God saved them from Balak, the king of Moab, in the wilderness, mm-hmm. and got them into the promise, promised land. Right. The mounds have seen how God in Israel's entire history have graciously given them absolutely <laughs> everything. You know. So he. So what he's doing is he's calling the mountains as a character witness. Yeah. He's <laughs> saying mountains. Will you come tell Israel how much I've done for them? Yeah. <laughs> the mountains are God's character witness. And it's like it's like the witness that comes to the stand. They're like, I I've never he wouldn't hurt a fly. Right. He's he's just the best guy I've ever met. 
And it's yep. like, that's the, I don't know that's why the they have a southern accent, but. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's Atticus witnesses. Finch. And, <laughs> that's what it is. It's uh, to, to kill, kill a mockingbird just, just like, just head. takes over your imagination. <laughs> and that's Every all. court case <laughs> is to kill a mockingbird. I also think it's maybe intentional, uh-huh. possibly in Deuteronomy. We're told and then in the book of Joshua, that there are these two mountains in the promised land. Yes. Called Mount Ebal and Mount Gerasim. Right. And one is called the Mountain of Blessing, and one is called the Mountain of Cursing. And Israel was supposed to stand on either mountain, and the cursings were read from one mountain, right. and the people of Israel responded by saying, we accept these curses. Mm-hmm. And all the blessings were read from the other mountain, and they were supposed to, be, they would, blessings would be recited, and they would say, we agree with these blessings. Right. And the mountains were there to hear all of it. And they were witnesses to God's covenant. The covenant then. ceremony. And so that means whenever you are in Israel, you could look up and you could see Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim and mm-hmm. be reminded of God's covenant. You you would see the witnesses to God's covenant. That's right. Right. And so he calls them in. And he's like, hey, uh, how have they been doing upholding all those things we agreed on? Should we bless them or curse them? So that was the idea. Yeah. And so. Which is just a cool image. And I think the emphasis here is not so much on Israel's obedience or disobedience no. yet, but God's character. It is, yeah. So this is God's character. He's saved them. He's established a leadership for them. He's protected them. He's given them a land. And what did God require mm. for all that? Right. When, like, whenever I, I mean, bring bring it in now, right? Like, bring in the 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 amount of blessing, the amount of cursing here. Yeah. Like when God gave the the covenant, when God brought you into the land of Israel, mm-hmm. what was on the line? Like, what did he say you must do to mm-hmm. stay in the land? Yes. Was it self-flagellate and do all kinds of crazy things? No. What, what was, what's the basis of the law? Like the covenant, the commands in the law, what were they? Boil them down for me. What did I require of you to free to stay in the land? It was to love God and love neighbor. Right. That was, that was Old Testament or the way that Micah says it here is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Yeah. That was what the law required. But instead, what Israel has done is subverted true worship of God and justice and kindness and humility for extravagant, hypocritical sacrifices. Right. And he says, like, did I ask for just thousands of rivers, 10,000 rivers of oil? <laughs> 10,000 rivers of oil. Did I ask for thousands of rams? He's like, well, I mean, did I ask for you to, like, sacrifice to me your firstborn son? No. And these are all things that Israel had the capacity and that they actually did. They yeah, sacrificed these. their firstborn son. They were in an, an era of, mil- of, of, of economic pros- prosperity. So they were giving more sacrifices when they were most evil than they did when they were faithful. Oof. And then God is saying, did I ask for any of that? Or did I ask for justice, Gosh. kindness, and mercy? Yeah. It's like, how did you guys get here? I didn't ask for this. Yeah. This is not the kind of God that I am. Yeah. I don't, I'm not the kind of God that wants all this stuff. I just want you to walk humbly with me to like do justice in the world, to and, love me and love your neighbor. Yeah. I'm just, I'm reminded of, uh, of Jesus's words on, um, on, uh, the Mount, uh, oh my goodness. Transfiguration. <laughs> the ser- sermon, sermon, sermon on the, on the Mount. Mount. Sorry. Sermon on the Mount where he says, you know, in that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, um, but I will cast them away mm-hmm. and they'll say, hold on. We did a bunch of extravagant things for you. Did we not mm-hmm. prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? We did all this stuff. And they like like put right. forward all these religious things that they did. And he's like, that's not what I want. And he says, away from me, I never knew you. Hmm. We we never walked humbly together. Yeah. We weren't in relationship. We're, hmm. You didn't you didn't you weren't doing the stuff that I'm about, which is like justice and mercy, which is what I've been talking about for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. And it's like Jesus requires of us the same thing. Mm. It's just come walk with him. That's good. Do justice. You don't have to peddle out all of these religious extravagant things that are really just hypocritical. Mm. Uh, I just think about like, especially in, in the West, how easy it is for us to fall prey to this, the same temptation. It's like, what does God require of us? Man, giant church buildings and big programs mm. and extravagant Easter services mm. and crazy, you know, Christmas Eve candlelight processionals and, yeah. you know, like whatever it is. Uh, you know, big soul harvest campaigns or mm, whatever. And I'm not yeah. saying anything, any of these things are necessarily evil. Don't hear No, me wrong. it's just it, it wouldn't, a, re- a religious show right. is different than 
heartfelt justice, kindness, and humility. Yeah, John Foreman has another song called More Than a Show. Yeah, he About does. the same idea, anyway. Yeah, it's really good. We were spiritually impacted by John Foreman in, Foreman in very formative ways. Yeah, I think he's riffing off of Isaiah 1 and, 1 and 2 there, anyway. He probably is. I don't remember that. Which was a contemporary of Micah. Uh, no, he was. He anyway. quotes. They quote each other. Yeah, so, anyway. Uh, anyway, so the mountains are called as witnesses to God's character. Right. Oh, Micah yeah. asks, Micah says God is required justice and mercy and right. kindness and humility you've responded with hypocritical sacrifices so what's the verdict right if this is the court case what's the verdict verse nine the voice of the lord cries to the city so this is jerusalem remember all the way back in chapter one we're told this is a judgment against jerusalem and it is sound wisdom to fear your name hear of the rod and of him who appointed it so the rod in this case is assyria coming mm-hmm. against israel can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? The idea here is, can I forget any longer how great your uh, injustice has been and how little justice has been done to you? Right. Like that, that's that's the idea. Like, right. he's, like, he's like, look, I have held back long enough. I've yes. been watching so much evil take place, so much trickery, so much bribery, so much oppression. Am I the kind of God who's just going to stand back and let that happen? No. Mm-hmm. Am I? Can I let that go on forever? No. I must act, and I'm going to judge you with the rod of Assyria. Yep. I, verse 13, I will strike you with a grievous blow and make you desolate because of your sins. And Israel, or Jerusalem, Israel's leadership, will be marked by this really ironic kind of justice. Mm-hmm. They will uh, eat and never be full. They will sow, but never harvest. They will make wine, but never enjoy it. Jerusalem will be, will, has filled herself with like self-destruction, destructive wisdom, mm-hmm. going after the idols of military power and religious performance, and they will soon self-destruct by God's hand. Yeah, That's the, the judgment for Jerusalem and its leadership in the way that it's led the nation. Yeah. Man, I mean, we, we've talked about this a bunch now in Micah with like uh, perfect justice or appropriate justice or mm-hmm. even ironic justice mm-hmm. that the ways that Israel sins end up being the ways that they are punished. Mm-hmm. There are these appropriate responses to sin. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, you depend on military might instead of me. I will use military might to judge you. Mm-hmm. Right? Like stuff yep. like that. And now it's and now it's kind of different here, but it's the same theme is kind of being played. Is that like, oh, you you're de- you're depending on all the vineyards that you have and the wine that you can tread out. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? You're going to tread it all out, but before it's bottled, you're going to be overtaken. Mm-hmm. And you'll never get a chance to drink it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this yeah this. I, w- what what difference are you pulling out there? I don't know if I'm going for a difference more. Just like I don't know if we've quite landed the plane mm-hmm. all throughout Micah on the podcasts of like. Why is this the way God goes about uh, justice? Um, it is through, and, and, I mean, a really simple way is like, man, it's just appropriate. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's just like yeah. God's justice is always meted out perfectly. That he, he's never um, overbearing in his in his mm-hmm. judgment. Right. Uh, and then there's also the whole idea of him as a wise counselor, a tactician we talked mm-hmm. about last week. Right. Where he, um, he, he ends up working your own sin against you just to show yeah. that he's smarter than you. Yeah. I mean, as, I mean, I'm just like, why is this the way that God, especially in Micah, like works yeah. this out? I mean, it's not just in Micah. It's right. Everywhere yeah. in scripture. And I mean, we talked about a ton of the Esther podcast, like, ev- like yes, that's the idea that you get back what you put in. Mm-hmm. You reap what you sow yeah. is like, I don't know why, except that it, it's, is I think almost everyone agrees that it's just like it's fair. It's fair if you trust in military. By the military, you will be destroyed. Mm. If you trust in wealth, the wealth will eat you alive. If you trust in beauty, and you use that to hurt others, you will get ugly. Like that. There's yeah. like there's this like inherent justice in the thing that you trust in devouring you. That I think most people accept, probably because it was that is justice. That is God being just. God has mm. established what justice is, yeah. and it's the perfect, proportionate um, correction, discipline, punishment yeah. for the crime. The punishment uh, always yeah, was the crime. Totally. Yeah. I'm also thinking about it as like an indictment against idolatry. Yeah. That like 
when we trust something the way we're supposed to trust God, God proves to us by using it to punish us that it was untrustworthy. Mm. So like, especially like in Micah where there was idolatry, it's called out in the yeah. first in the for, first court case um, that uh, it's like, man, they trust in military and more right. than me. Well, I'll show them by using their military. And it shows you them. who's really in charge. Exactly. If God can manipulate their idols to judge them, the idol was never God. Exactly. God is. Yeah. Which is like really interesting. Uh, there's like th- there's a broader theological conversation that we've talked about multiple times about the active and passive wrath of God. Mm-hmm. The passive wrath of God is like you getting what you deserve. Sin is its own consequence. And you 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 commit adultery, your marriage falls apart. Right, and like we see it all over here. Right. This like idea like you reap what you sow. Right, li- literally. And then the active wrath of God, which people talk about as God like actively being like sending somebody to hell or something right, like that. Sure. But I don't understand why there needs to be a difference, mm-hmm. especially in a place like the book of Micah. Right. You have sin being its own consequence. You make political allies, those political alliances fall apart and those political alliances cannibalize you. And who's in good charge of the nations? Yeah. God is. Right. And besides how many coincidences and small little <laughs> things would need to happen perfectly so that Assyria would end up finding out about the betrayal. Like, yeah, it's too perfect. It's of a, too perfect of, of a trap. It's too perfect of a trap. Only a, a perfect war tactician could have put this together. So it's like the idea that sin is his own consequence. I think God's involved in that. Like totally. I don't think active and passive wrath are like sep- like separate things. Separate things. And I think yeah. that's what we're seeing here. God right. is responding appropriately to justice always. Mm-hmm. There's never a time when God overreacts to wrongdoing. Yeah. You always get what you most desire. <laughs> yeah in the way that you didn't expect it. Like that's totally. kind of it's like, always ironic. it's always ironic. Yeah. I'm just trying to like, even th- this, this might, this, this reflection, this meditation feels a little like, pardon anybody who just doesn't quite follow me here, but yeah. like a little like, uh, like, I don't know, like Alexandrian in my, <laughs> oh, I don't even follow you. <laughs> like the church fathers. Like yeah. there were different strands of, of seeing Christ in all of scripture mm-hmm. and different hermeneutics that they would apply. Yeah. And some of the Alexandrian fathers got a little mystical mm-hmm. in their ways of seeing Christ in scripture. And so this might feel a little bit that, but, but. Uh, I was just, I was just thinking about the enemies of the cross. We talked a little bit about this last week, mm-hmm. but the enemies that came to, um, defeat Jesus on the cross, the, the Romans, mm-hmm. the Pharisees, Satan himself and his legions, right? They came out and they sought to eat a feast, but they were not satisfied, right? Mm. Like they, 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 yeah. they sought to tread out his blood, but they did not get to drink the wine that they mm. were expecting. Like, yeah. I was just like, there's all this language of like, uh, right. what you, what they hoped to expect was, was not brought. They about. hoped to crucify a political revolutionary. Instead, they crowned the king of the universe. Yes. Like that's, yeah. They put king of the Jews ironically, but right. it was, God made it unironic like yes. <laughs> when he rose from the dead. Like that's true. Yeah. That ironic justice, like the cross is this interesting irony or the reversal of irony is the way God does justice in the world. It yeah. brings peace and establishes his rule. And then the opposite in the kingdom of God is also really interesting where Jesus is like, oh, do you want to be comforted? Then mourn. Yeah. Right. It's like, do you want wine? Like, do you want, like, do you want wine? Well, don't spend your life treading out the grapes. Do you want to live? So die. Right. It's yeah. just, it's so interesting how many, how much reversal there is in this. I know we talked about this last week too, but I just can't get away from it. It's just everywhere here in Micah. So yeah. Yeah. Death precedes yeah. life. It's uh, it's cool. Okay, so so he said he's called the mountains. Mm-hmm. They've they've given a, a guilty verdict because Israel did not give what God required, which was just walking with mm-hmm. Him humbly and creating justice in the world. Instead, they brought these hypocritical sacrifices, and uh, so he says he's going to strike them on the teeth and on the, or on the yeah. cheek, in the mouth, and uh, cause all these ironic punishments to come against them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's yep. that's where we are. That's where we are. Okay. Um, and they say, it, he kind of summarizes this way in verse 16. You've kept the statutes of Omri and all the works of the house of Ahab. To evil kings. Yeah, and kind of like the archetypical, the right. prototypical evil kings. Like throughout the book of Kings or Chronicles, it'll always refer back to the sins, the sins of, of Ahab. Ahab. He walked in the ways of his father and Ahab. They were these wrong, they were, they were not, the kings of God. Mm. So much so that when Matthew records his genealogy, he says there's 14 kings between uh, uh-huh. King David and Jesus. Actually, there's 18. 
four of them are all descended from oh, Omri. And uh, he just excludes them because they're not the true king. Whoa. Because uh, they're not, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's like you followed in the path of people that were corrupt. And remember what Ahab did? He stole a vineyard. Right. And he took it for himself. So, okay, you, you got a vineyard in all of presses by mm. treachery, by murder, by deceit, right. by cannibalism, by conspiracy. And so because of that, you'll receive none of the rewards. Doesn't he die in the vineyard? Uh, he does die yeah, in an ironic death. Like the vineyard he thought he would he would get life through. Yeah, he would enjoy. Grave. It would, yeah. So interesting. And he says, you've walked in all their councils. This is yep. the same word we picked mm-hmm. apart last week as their... Yep. They're war tacticians. Mm-hmm. He's like, you thought that the best way to go about living in my kingdom was to follow the political war advice mm-hmm. of evil kings who said, like, you know yeah. what? Let's make treaties with uh, Egypt to get all their chariots. Let's pay off Assyria with their high taxes, mm-hmm. and we can negotiate the terms of our own peace. Yep. And you've listened to the wrong tacticians. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. And I mean, again, we did this talk about this last week, but First Corinthians one and two, it talks about the wisdom of the leaders of the world is opposite to this. Yeah, like the wisdom, of, the council of the world will always tell you to pursue power and land and money in order to secure yourself some version of salvation. Mm. And Jesus, all, like, the gospel comes, the way of God comes, the kingdom of God comes and say, no, the way that you become the nation where people flock to, where justice is done, is by saying no to all those things right. and pursue justice, humility, and kindness. Yeah, you cannot serve both God and mammon, yeah. the false god of money. Mm-hmm. You uh, like Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, yeah. and then I'll add everything else to you. And we've glossed over this, but like we talked about idolatry, these fake sacrifices, yes, yes. Made, the hypocritical sacrifices. But at the same time, all this uh, um, corruption is going on. Uh-huh. Those things are connected. The further right. away they get from true worship of God, the more injustice is being done. The less they actually mean it when they sacrifice a ram, the more they're paying off to Egypt. Yeah. Like they're like the the great religious observance can coincide. Like always co like hypocritical religious yes, yes, observance. Yes always coincides with increasing corruption and idolatry or corruption and injustice yeah. in Israel. Dang. Those things are always linked together. Whew. Okay. I mean, as we, uh, as we wrap up chapter six, then mm-hmm. like, cause there's gonna be a huge shift in chapter seven. Mm-hmm. What, like, what's the primary way you're reflecting on the cross here? I mean, we've talked about the ironic reversal of the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I'm also trying to remember the mountains being called, yeah. Uh, walking humbly with God. I'm trying to think about the God can no longer watch the mi- uh, wicked men use wicked scales and deceitful yeah. wages. I'm like, how are you reflecting on the well, gospel? One day, finally, that won't exist anymore. Yeah. The innocent will rule. The mm-hmm. abused will be comforted. The oppressed will be liberated. Like the evil rulers of the world will be thrown down. Mm. And I think there's like, we miss like for the spiritual reality, the physical reality of this. There was a whole bunch of oppressed, lame, weak, sick people in Israel oppressed by actual leaders who were bankrupted by them. And they all got wiped out when Assyria came in. Mm -hmm. The leaders were gone. And then the faithful people re-inherited a new Israel and became who? The new leaders of it. Ezra, Nehemiah, they were the new leaders of a new Israel. They Mm. got back what they lost. Yeah. They became, like, that's the good news is that they're gone and we get to be in charge. Right. We get to move into the ruins and rule again. Yeah. Like. That is really interesting. Man. And and so that happened to Israel in history. uh Uh-huh. That happens with us spiritually right now. Like we rule and reign with Jesus. Right. If like our oppressors don't have the final word, our abusers don't have the final word, the corrupt don't have the final word. Who are the rich in the kingdom of God? Those who are poor. Right. Who are those that celebrate? Those are who are mourning the death of their loved ones. That's who's celebrating. And then in the final reality, when all evil and justice is judged, who reigns with Jesus? The innocent. Yeah. The oppressed, right? Those who trust that evil will one day have a coming judgment. Mm, yeah, that's Man, the good news. It's so good. I'm now. I'm. You got me thinking. Now I'm thinking about like, uh, two two things, and, and they're all about like the extravagant 
hypocritical offerings versus the like humble ones of of the people of God. One is like compare the illustrious, gorgeous construction of Herod's second temple. Okay. The temple that was around in Jesus' day. Yep. I mean, so much so that right after Jesus threw a tizzy in the temple and exit out, exited out of it, his disciples turned around and were like, man, look how beautiful the temple is. <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, it was a gorgeous structure. Yeah. Uh, because, like, Herod built it out of pride and wanted to, you know, be like, look how great and benevolent he was compensating of a, of a ruler something. I am. Yeah. No wonder if he was. He didn't seem to have any kind of <laughs> compensation issues. Anyway, um, it was gorgeous. It was huge, you know. And then, all of a sudden, with Jesus dying, the temple curtain being torn into, the Holy Spirit now coming to indwell new temples. Where? Hmm. Us. Yeah. And Paul calls us in Second Corinthians four not gorgeous gilded temples. He says the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us as jars of clay. Hmm. Like we're not these huge spectacles anymore. Yeah. Like the, the, the temple of God is no longer fragile human beings. Yeah. Now carry the power of the kingdom. It's crazy. So I'm just thinking about that, hmm. you know, that, that comparison about the, the golden age of Israel versus mm-hmm. the humble age of the church. Yeah. Where now God's home is here inside David and Seth. And think about the good, you, are, you just said it. The good news is that entrance into that kingdom, the inheritance of leadership and kingdom of justice is achieved how by humility right not not to the rich right not to those with power to the humble yeah who say they don't have power and need help and they need and they want to see justice reign that's who inherits the kingdom of god that simple that simple yet active faith Mm. compared to the extravagance of those in power is all that's needed to inherit the true kingdom. Yeah. So that's that's the first thing I was thinking. The second was the the difference in both Israel's old sacrificial system and our own current, like I don't know, ways that we sacrifice here in the West. Yeah, we try to atone yeah. for our we try sins. to atone for our sins mm-hmm. and everything like that through through different for di- through different means. But for for the time being, let's compare Israel's sacrifice mm-hmm. with Jesus on the cross. I mean. Micah here is referencing thousands of rivers of oil and thousands of rams and, you know, like all of these extravagant sacrifices. Uh, I mean, just imagine the daily manpower it took Mm -hmm. to maintain the temple. Like it was a humongous sacrificial system. Um, And imagine like the weight of that, that it would have carried with the nation of Israel. Like how extravagant the sacrifice must be to atone for Mm -hmm. our sins. And then all of a sudden, we're supposed to think that one meager death of a humble carpenter is mm. better mm-hmm. than all those extravagant sacrifices? Yeah. And Micah would say, yes. Mm-hmm. Why? Because God wasn't looking for an extravagant sacrifice necessarily. He was looking for the right sacrifice, mm-hmm. a good sacrifice. He was looking for someone who would walk humbly, do justice, love mercy, mm-hmm. and sacrifice. That's... Jesus' death on the cross is the appropriate reaction to God's covenant. Yes. God's covenant was like, here's the land, here's all the blessings, and here's all the cursing. So what do you do, Israel? How should you have responded? And Jesus gives that response. Mm. He humbly dies so that others can receive justice. Right. That's the right sacrifice. That's the right sacrifice. Yeah, performed by the right kind of person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was just thinking, and I just think about like the objection I've heard people bring up today. It's just like, what does one guy's death 2,000 years ago mm-hmm. have to do with me today? It just seems like a blip on the radar. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you're trying to compare the extravagant sacrifice. You think the extravagant sacrifices are what God wants, I, not yeah. something humble and lowly. Okay, so Seth, you have all of chapter seven figured out, so I'm just going to let you run this ship. Yeah, <laughs> uh, this is my th- that's my setup for you to help us explain. So how how, how in kind the of great song by John Foreman, uh, he is the tone of the letter shifts pretty dramatically. Yeah, so we have we just had like you know the prophecy of doom, and we we're kind of expecting a prophecy of hope, but that's mm-hmm. kind of how Micah's been structured so far. But in this next section, Micah 
takes up the prophecy, but instead of like continuing it with a prophecy of hope or another prophecy of doom for Israel or Jerusalem or for Assyria, he acts as if the prophecy is happening to him. Mm. And so there's a couple ways to read that. One is like he's just lamenting his place in a a soon to be decimated Israel. But I think more significantly, he is acting like a representative Israelite Mm. who is mourning the lack of justice in in Israel, Mm. mourning the coming judgment, and then talking to God about it as a representative for Israel. So it's, okay. it's, uh, does that make does that make sense? I think so. You interrupted yourself I about did? the great song of John Foreman. I was curious what you were going to... I did interrupt yeah. myself? What were you going to say about uh, that? Well, he basically has the whole thing as, as Micah speaking to God. Uh-huh. And all of chapter 7 is his talks with God. Okay. Uh, that's him talking that's to how God. John Foreman in the song right. interprets it. However, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Micah is acting and speaking to God, but I think different characters jump in at different right. points. This so is, like, yeah, this is what I was joking about. Uh, because like I Micah talks for a second and then Jerusalem, the idolatrous city responds uh-huh. and then God responds and then Micah responds again. So it's like there's characters acting and not just one person speaking. And okay. I think that's the most important thing yeah. to probably... Flag. Okay, so multiple characters are talking. You've got Micah in the mix. You've got Jerusalem as a corporate body in the mix. Mm-hmm. You've got God in the conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a sense, you have a lot of the characters from the court cases yeah. now giving their some concluding thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and now you have this idea then of a representative Israelite mm-hmm. that you talked about. Uh, yeah. Like, I mean, what's... he's embodying the pain of Israel. Uh-huh. He's sympathizing with the plight of Israel and he's hoping it's like, and he knows that justice is coming. Mm. And then he also embodies like the right response of Israel. So maybe like the right response is, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation and my God will hear me. He's mourning as a representative Israelite, but he's also being the faithful Israelite that will remain, that will be the remnant that will return to okay. become a leader. Does it- yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm hearing you. There's a lot going on. There's okay, a lot going so on. Let, let's talk about let's talk about this. There's so many things. Let's talk about the 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 mourning. The mourning. He's mourning as a representative Israelite. Yes. So whenever it starts in in seven one, woe is me. Woe is me. For I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, and there's no cluster to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, Mike is not necessarily talking about his own self. He's not all of a sudden throwing a pity party. No. He's he's embodying the corporate pain of his people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would this be, can I, this is a little tongue in cheek, mm-hmm. but like I was trying to think of an analog to this. It was like, yeah. Is like Uncle Sam the representative American? <laughs> like, oh, like, could you see like a almost like a political cartoon of Uncle Sam, like, yeah, mourning something that's going on in America, or, like, right? And the fact that it's, yeah, I, I think maybe you've got this mighty yeah, prophet embody. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was, I was trying to find an analog for. I think that representative works. Well, Israelite. I mean, it's like. If if the president the president is our representative, is the American oh, sure, representative. Sure, sure, yeah. So if he got on TV and mourned and wept for the injustice in the nation, that and, would mean a lot. And and then broadcast it to the world, that would that would say something. Yeah, the the, the wider the wider community of the world would probably be like, oh man, I guess America, mm-hmm. speaking corporately, right. is finally coming to terms with the injustices they're causing. Right. And remember, Micah is a court prophet. He would have been in Jerusalem. Yeah. He was part. He was a significant member, a of, cabinet member, a cabinet member. Yeah. So, like, his representation means something yeah, yeah, to yeah. Israel. Okay. So he says, "Woe is me, for I become as when summer fruit has been gathered, and there's nothing to be gleaned, no right. cluster to eat, no ripe fig that my soul desires." So the question is, what is he talking about? What is the fruit that he wants but can't get? It's the fact that he. I mean, it, it's a lot of the fruit, the same fruit that Jesus talks about. It's the fruit of good people. It's specifically good leaders. Yeah. Verse three. All their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and the great man, the leader, utters the evil desires of his soul. Micah is de- is looking in all of Israel for a good leader, and he can find none. There is no fruit of justice. There is no seed of righteousness. Right. There is no one who can act justly on behalf of Israel. The best leader in Israel isn't like a 
a tree bearing fruit. Mm -hmm. It's like a briar, a thorn hedge. They're an obstacle to judge justice, not just not the, 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 the instrument of justice. Yeah. And their confusion, he says, their judgment, their turmoil, their exile is coming quickly. Yeah. That's that's what he's mourning the loss of. Okay. But you're right to point to Jesus. Right. Because he said, and he says again, a fig tree. We talked, we, mm -hmm. we we waxed eloquent about fig trees a little while ago. But remember, after Jesus uh, throws over the the tables in the temple, he leaves the temple in most of the gospel accounts, mm -hmm. and he finds a fig tree bearing what? No fruit. Leaves, but no fruit. Leaves, but no fruit. And then he curses it, mm -hmm. and then it withers and dies. Right. And everyone's like, why did he do that? Yeah, I mean, his, his disciples were confused. His disciples were confused. And the reason why he did that is the same reason Micah's warning. Warning: Jesus was hoping for just leaders, good priests, good people to yep. lead the temple. And they're all corrupt. They're all evil. Yeah, they have the signs that they should bear fruit, right? They're making sacrifices yep. and they're doing all the right things. The, the tree had leaves, mm -hmm. but no fruit. And it so was hip, it was hypocritical. It was hypocritical. Yeah. And so it's it withers. Right. Just like Jerusalem. And then just like Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, will be withered here. Oh, so man. it's Jesus. Yeah. He fulfills it. <laughs> he fulfills a lot of Micah. Uh, and then this happens. Yeah. Jesus quotes the next passage from Micah. Micah says this: Don't put trust in a neighbor. Don't have confidence in your friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. So don't speak to the woman in your arms. Mm. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. So what he's saying is God is coming mm -hmm. to judge Jerusalem. And in his coming, he will divide the city. Yeah. They will be confused. The leaders will be confused and all the inhabitants will be confused. So they'll be divided on what to do next. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law will disagree. Father and son mm -hmm. won't know what to do. And Jesus says this exact same thing. Yes. When he comes, judges Jerusalem because there's no figs in the fig tree, he says, I didn't come to bring peace. But a sword. But a sword, yeah. war. And I'm going to divide people because they're not going to know what to do with the fact that I'm destroying the old religious establishment and starting a new kingdom. Right. Yeah. He fulfills it. Right. Period. And I was like, what more do you do with that? Except mm. that's what he did. He broke down a system of religious corruption, established a new kingdom of God, mm -hmm. and people didn't know what to do with them and eventually killed him for yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, this, this happens all the time today. You know, you have a child who grows up in an atheistic household or maybe a Muslim household or whatever, mm -hmm. and they want to become a Christian, they get estranged from their parents. Mm -hmm. And there's all this conflict and division. Because yeah. what? Because of the news of the kingdom of God yep. has come. And like, I mean, I've heard like versions of this fight that happen, and it sounds a lot like Micah, you know? Or it's just like, it's like, what? So you're saying that now that you're a Christian that God's going to judge me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dad, I guess I am saying that. Mm -hmm. Well, then I don't want anything to do with you. Mm -hmm. It's like that those conversations happen. Mm -hmm. It's like believing in Jesus does put a division between even father and son. I'm also thinking about the way that this happens within the believing community. Because mm. presumably these leaders would have held... right that God is the God of the universe, mm -hmm. that there was a Messiah coming, that the temple was the only true place to worship. They would have been theologically orthodox, at least on the surface, right? but their lives would have been marked by a lack of justice and kindness and humility. So I have a lot of stories of people who are rejecting the religion of their parents who claimed to know Christ, but say that it's not marked by justice and mercy the way, the way that mm. God desires. Yeah. Like, that that story still happens. Like I've met the real Christ. He's come to judge the religious establishment, right. not uphold the status quo that you keep saying is so good and right. Yeah. It, so it's like Oof. this happens a lot. This you're right. It's, yeah. This is still Je the reality. Jesus as a teacher, as a judge, as a savior, as a way of life, as a person is divisive. Yes. Um. And so was the judgment in Micah's day. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine. Micah's prophecy all throughout his whole book. We keep hearing tell of these other prophets who would come to him and be like, dude, shut up. Stop right. prophesying. We don't talk like that here. 
Why are you causing division? God are, said he would never judge yeah. Israel. Why are you causing all this headache and, right. and being such a Debbie Downer, man? Just mm-hmm. like kumbaya, bro. <laughs> you know? like <laughs> Right. He's just like, but the mess- the true message of God is not necessarily one of kumbaya for mm-hmm. everybody. Right. Uh, I think I was reading one commentator and they thought, it was like, the, the leaders of Israel are right to presume upon God's mercy. I will slow to anger and yeah. abounding in steadfast love, but I will by no means clear the guilty. Yeah. The leaders of Israel were talking about the first part without realizing they were falling afoul of the second part. And the more Micah tries to emphasize that, the more they tell him to shut up. Mm-hmm. I, we, we're not guilty of those crimes. We're okay here. God's not coming to judge us for our trust in the military, mm. our idolatry, our whatever. So, yeah, man, I, we're going to be able to lean into that even more here in just a second. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he, he talks about how, woe is me, everything's terrible, representative mm-hmm. Israel. But as for me. Yeah, he's like, uh, yeah, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation, and my God will hear me. Mm-hmm. So, my enemies, people out there, mm-hmm. and he's, again, being representative of Israel, or is this Jerusalem now? Talking? This is, he's, this is Jerusalem talking yeah. or Micah talking as, as a representative, representative of Israel. <laughs> Jerusalem okay. and the remnant within it. Like okay. it's so he's talking. Israel is talking to their enemies. Micah is talking to, to to their enemies, and he's saying, "Don't rejoice over us, Assyria, Babylon, all the enemies of the Lord, because when I fall, mm-hmm. I shall rise." Which is what we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. It's only after Mount Zion, the mount, the mountain is leveled, that it will be risen up again. Mm -hmm. It's when I sit in darkness that the Lord will be a light to me. Mm -hmm. Those those things are almost sound simultaneous. Yeah. That's in death, I will find life. I I will bear the indignation of the Lord. I will bear the guilty verdict of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes judgment for me. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting loaded phrase. Oh, yeah. So if, so if he's talking as a representative, Jerusalem, Jerusalem will bear the indignation of the Lord, right? Because it's sinned against him, right? Israel, Babylon Jer- will be will come and wipe them out. But then one day God will plead Jerusalem's case and execute judgment for Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. But I thought, but I thought they were this. <laughs> they rightfully deserve that. Yeah, and I think this might get into like that remnant idea. Yeah. There is a people within Israel that were always innocent, right. always faithful, always crying out to looking to the Lord for justice. Yeah. And it's these people that will be raised up. So then there's actually four court cases in Micah. Oh. Right? There's the three that it's yeah. patterned around, but there's a fourth one that it expects. Interesting. Right? There's a new future court case, which yeah. has happened already, but not for Micah. For mm-hmm. us, it's happened. And it's in exile. Think about like the some of the exilic psalms in the Bible. Mm-hmm. They are asking God to come back and bring them back into the land and respond and listen and and will awake from his yeah. slumber because they're innocent and they're pursuing him. They're the mm-hmm. remnant crying out and finally God will hear their case mm-hmm. and he will say, you're right and now I'm going to enact justice for you mm-hmm. and bring you back. And ultimately he does that through coming to them as this shepherd king Micah proph- prophesied yeah. about in Jesus. Yes. Um, that's amazing. Uh, one thing that I just like can't get away from, and I haven't said it out loud yet, so okay. I got I might have to try to work through it. Okay. But I, I, when I was reading this today, I was really struck by this idea that the the lie that the religious elite, the rulers of Israel in Micah's day, the lie that they believed was so potent because it had a kernel of truth into it, mm-hmm. that God is supremely forgiving mm-hmm. is just dumb uh, like completely baffling bafflingly uh kind and long suffering mm-hmm. right like slow to anger slow abounding. to anger like so kind mercy for a thousand generations exodus says right um and that's so true the problem is they didn't believe that that that, that god had any justice against his own people at all any any yeah. discipline for them they leveraged that understanding of God's love to say, well, that means there's no requirements that come with that love. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, because what Micah goes on to say is, is that like, there will be so much forgiveness for him and there will mm-hmm. be like, all his sin will be trampled on. And he, like, it's just, he goes on to just mm-hmm. baffle my brain about the forgiveness of God to where I'm like, 
I'm a little offended by the end of Micah for mm-hmm. how forgiving God is. Yeah. And so like that that's the kernel of truth that the that these religious leaders had. The problem was they didn't believe they had to suffer first. Mm. That they didn't have to have punishment first. That God was only one thing and mm. couldn't be two things. Mm. He couldn't be just and merciful. He could only be merciful and he therefore could've... they could turn a blind right. eye to justice. Well, it's like they didn't imagine him they, that he could be a father. Hmm. A father disciplines the children that he loves right so god could be a grandfather <laughs> only giving out goodies <laughs> and the trees and yeah. never doing the punishment but he couldn't be an actual loving kind reme- like mm. father offering remedial justice mm-hmm. the type that cleanses them and corrects them and brings them into his image right um so he says i'll plead my case God will execute judgment on my behalf, Jerusalem's behalf, the remnant's behalf, and he shall bring me out of light, and I shall look upon his vindication. Now, I was wondering, vindication here could mean two things. Okay. It could mean the vindication of the innocent. See, I was truly innocent because Uh, now I've been restored. Kind of like a Job thing. Yeah, like I've been vindicated. Okay. See, you got like, see? Um, But it could also be God's vindication. Oh, vindicating himself as both just and merciful. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's either all way. Yeah. Um, and then he says, and then on that day when my when I'm vindicated, uh-huh, I guess uh-huh. my enemy will see and shame will cover her head. Mm. Those who said to me, "Where is the Lord your God?" Which again is something Sennacherib said at the gates of Israel with his 185,000 army. Yep. He and did. And then my eyes, Jerusalem's eyes, will look upon her. And she will be trampled down like mire in the streets, which again happened, happened. in Second Kings eighteen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Goodness, I mean that's amazing. Uh, it's also happened in a sense when Jesus was on the cross. Mm-hmm. It's like if you if you are the Lord, where's your God now? Yes. If you are the Lord, come on down off the cross. And then what? In his resurrection, he put to shame the powers. Yeah. Rejoice not over me, Pharisees, Roman. Just imagine Jesus saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, because when I fall, Jesus says on the cross, "I will rise." Rise. When I sit in the darkness of the grave, the Lord will lead me to light. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. He did. Jesus bore our sins on the cross, not because I have sinned against Him, but because He took our sins on Himself. Because He pled our case. Yeah, and, and He pleads our case and executes justice for us. Like Jesus could have. And then my enemy will see, Satan will see, the empire will see, Rome will see, and shame will cover them. All who said, where is the Lord your God? Mm. And he'll trample down death and sin itself. And it's so good. It's good. It's, it's so good, good news. It's, it's so good news. Good. Oh, man. Okay, so verse 11 then. So <laughs> I, a day for building your walls. It, it that's gets, the sentence? That's the sentence. But uh, so if, if it's Micah speaking as representative Israelite, and then Jerusalem responding. I think this is God responding to Jerusalem's faith. So Jerusalem has just admitted that even the, at the end of exile, we'll come back. They, okay. they know, they have learned the lesson of the Lord. They learned that resurrection comes after death. And then God responds and says, there will be a day for the building of your walls. Uh, and I think that, that word walls isn't like strategic fortified walls. It's like the word fences, hmm. like a shepherd's fence. Ah, uh, yeah. So he, he's pulling on that same imagery. And in that day, the boundary mm-hmm. shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and from the cities of Egypt and from Egypt to the river the, or Euphrates. And so the idea is God responds to Israel's faith, say, okay, when, you come, when you're resurrected, when you come back out of exile, there's going to be a day of fence building. But it won't be around Jerusalem. The boundaries will be far, far extended. extended. Room enough for the nations of the world, Assyria and Egypt, uh, the, to all come in to the nation. And from, from sea, sea to, to sea, sea. And from mountain to mountain. And they yeah. will all live in peace in the kingdom. It's amazing. The reversal that's happened is that Israel thought that they could become a superpower mm-hmm. by strategic military alliances and pursuing everything in their own power. Yeah. And they shrunk and their cities were overtaken by Assyrian mm-hmm. attacks and they were cornered into one mm-hmm. tiny little stronghold. Right. Yeah. But it's in death and in humiliation mm-hmm. and by naming the, their need and saying, woe is me 
that their boundaries are extended to the ends of the earth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's the gospel. So it's cool. so cool. Okay. Oh man. Um, Amazing. Yeah, I was also thinking about you, you just mentioned that the irony there. There's a prophecy in Micah two where like God will gather Israel like sheep in a pen. Yes. Like in that tiny cramped space. As all of Israel flees Sennacherib's attacks and goes to the last stronghold of Jerusalem, then God reverses it. Okay. Cool. And then Micah responds to God's response. So God says there's going to be this day when the borders are going to be enlarged. Mm-hmm. People are going to flow in. And then Micah responds and says, then God, please shepherd your people with your staff, mm. the flock of your inheritance who dwell and then make us dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Mm. Like, that's like Garden of Eden. Would you put it, put us back in the Garden of Eden, please, and walk among us as Let our shepherd? Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as they did in the days of old, which is a callback to Moses and the territory that he presided over. Okay. Um, as in the days when you came, then when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. Mm. This is now that God is responding. So I forgot. So that's God talking. God saying, now, yep. as in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show you marvelous I'll, things. I'll do another Exodus. Yep. And he's quoting here uh, Moses' song after they crossed the Red Sea. Oh, in Exodus 15. In Exodus 15. Yep. The nations then will be see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouth and their ears shall be deaf. Whoa. I've never heard. I, I just I just I guess I read over this verse sixteen that the nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might, not in their might mm. or because of their might they'll be ashamed. Mm. They'll look at how strong they are and be ashamed of it. Mm-hmm. This is a good yeah because they'll know it's the wrong qualification to be in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly that's it's like Israel trusts in its might and it downfell and they'll look at their might and feel ju- they'll they'll know that's the wrong way uh-huh but it's also i think the other way is like well it's not good enough oh right they'll look at how strong god actually is and they'll be like oh i thought i was really strong right it's like yeah it's i'm like- the most powerful nation in the world <laughs> and i can do nothing to move the needle towards my in, in my yeah. favor when it comes to god yeah, it'd be like be like doing your you're like a, a personal best on bench press or something and you're like yeah. put it up and then a guy next to you does like 10 times as much like effortlessly yeah and you're like oh i'm ashamed of my strength I, i'm ashamed of my strength that's cool yeah that's that's better yeah yeah uh, and then in that same moment that they're ashamed they will lick the dust like a serpent mm. like the crawling things of the earth they shall come trembling out of their stronghold and turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you, Israel. So there's so, a, wait, hold on. Are you telling me that God's going to put them back in a garden and a shame and put shame over a serpent? He's going to put God, the people of God, the people of God, back in the garden, and he's going to cover their enemies with shame uh-huh. and crush them like the serpent. This sounds familiar. It might sound familiar. <laughs> um, like it's it's Genesis three. It's just yeah. the promise of Genesis three fifteen when God crushes the head of the serpent, but then also everyone who follows the serpent, mm-hmm. Assyria and Babylon, he crushes yeah. their head. But ultimately, Satan and death and Rome and false religion is all crushed under the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah, and it's like, wait, why would God do this? Like read all of Micah, mm-hmm. and it's just like Israel's the worst. Like God's people are the worst. I'm the worst. Mm-hmm. You know, like the church is sometimes yeah. the worst. Like mm-hmm. Christians are sometimes the worst. Paul was the chief of sinners, right? You know, like we're the worst. W- like what kind of God would offer salvation and kindness and and uh, yeah. return to Eden? And that's the question mm-hmm. Micah a- asks next. He who meditates like, on his own name. Yeah, we've mentioned this before, but Micah means who is like God. That's yeah. what his name means. And so he ends with this little poem that starts with his own name. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. How can you just, who is a God like this? Who can look at all of our sin clearly in the eyes. The mountains have witnessed to it. Mm-hmm. And say, and not retain his anger forever, but yeah. instead delights in steadfast love. I mean, it's amazing. It's like the the book of Micah seems to to give us one of two versions of of God, mm-hmm. and they're both false. Mm-hmm. One is the God of the, the the leaders, yeah, who is like 
is granddad who gives out Werther's candies all day mm -hmm. and never brings justice. Yeah. And that God's false. But like people still ascribe that like mm -hmm. that character to God today. Mm -hmm. That God is just peace, love, and pixie dust. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. And he's like, no, that God is not big enough. That's mm -hmm. that's not that, that God is like you. That God is like in your yeah. image, how you want him to be. And then there's like a version, I think, of God that we can easily come away from some of the prophetic books thinking about which is just yeah. an angry god mm -hmm. who just is just judging and wrathful and like and like we we don't know how to make a third in between god because yeah. he's not like something that we can conceive he will again have compassion on us he will tread our iniquities under his foot who what god can do both right <laughs> uh he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea yeah he will show faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham as he had sworn our fathers. Mm. It is powerful to think that God's promises to people like Abraham and David and uh, Judah mm -hmm. win out over their sin. Yeah. All, none of these people were great. Right. Exempt, like perfect. Perfect. Like perfect or, you know, even... Does like you you don't always want to mirror your life after some of the characters in the mm -hmm. Bible that God chooses, um, but He counts His promise to them as more significant than their sin. Mm. And yeah. there there are there are things that you must follow: do justice, love mercy, and if you decide not to do those things, you will get your just reward. Right. But He will never abandon those who do justice love mercy and walk humbly with God. Right. Like there's no end to that promise even when a whole nation so wholeheartedly comes together in opposition to that, God will not abandon it. Yeah. And it's like I'm like there's a corporate way to read this, I think is kind mm -hmm. of what you yeah. just what you just said that he will again have compassion on Israel. On Israel. He will tread Israel's iniquities underfoot. God, you will cast all of Israel's sins into the depths of the sea so that you can finally show faithfulness to us again. Mm -hmm. You can you can rejoin yourself with us. Mm -hmm. But man, there's a like in Jesus especially, there is a individual way to read this, mm -hmm. you know, or as members of the church if you want to keep it corporal. Well, yeah, right? I, that's what I, I was yeah. going to kept thinking that, but yes, yeah, let's do both. But like man, I just like you you say like if I okay, if I do justice and if I love mercy and if I walk humbly, then mm -hmm. God will God has mercy for me. And I'm like, I'm gonna miss that mark. Mm -hmm. And I'm just it's just but who's a God like you who pardons my iniquities? Mm -hmm. Pass o passes over my transgressions, right? Mm -hmm. Like like uh, who doesn't just retain your anger against my sin, but delights to give me steadfast steadfast love. You have compassion on me. You you tr you crush my sin that's in me, mm -hmm. and then you cast all my sins in the depths of the sea. Like, and that's only possible in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That that He was able to actually pay for my sin, yeah, pardon my iniquity, and, uh, like, and show steadfast love to me at the same time. Yeah. Like, because it's when I'm judged that I live. Mm -hmm. But how could I be judged and live at the same time? Hmm. In Christ. Mm -hmm. The church right. is in Christ. How can I die and yet right. live forever? In Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that we yeah. can both bear the punishment for our sins and live. Mm -hmm. We must be in Christ who bore the punishment for our sin on the cross yeah. and lived by being risen from the dead and seated at the right hand of God forever. Yeah, It's the only way that we can do both, both as individuals and as the church at large who is the body of Christ. Right. We are joined with him. Um, man, it's so good. Yeah, and I was thinking too as you were, you met you started that that off by saying, "Well, I'll fall short of that mark of loving justice and doing oh, kindness, sure, yeah. walking like humility." I think the way that I was thinking about that, no, that's faith. Yeah, that that is the definition by faith alone mm -hmm. means do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Like those are not in competition with one another, which is why we have a rule behind the scenes. Like we never ju say just have faith. Right. We do have a rule. We, we, we never say in a spoken gospel Devo, like right. just believe God and everything will be okay. Or just put your faith in Jesus because it trivializes the cost of faith, the, which the fact that Israel's leaders were not able to do it should like highlight that yeah. for you. You have people 
who were in tr- given everything God could like they protected, liberated, given a land, like all that's happening. God has given them everything that they need mm. to follow the covenant well. Yeah. And their hearts do not allow them to have faith in God. And I think your your point still stands. Yeah. How do we have faith in God when the cost is so high? Mm. We must die to ourselves, trust in the one who can resurrect us from the dead, mm. and then bring us into the life that we haven't been able to live up to yet. Right. We need that. Yeah. Or another way to think about it too is whenever he talks about crushing our iniquities and casting our sins into the sea, he's not just talking about their their courtroom penal consequences. Mm-hmm. He's talking about their power. How am yeah. I ever supposed to walk humbly with God when I'm so proud? Yeah. How can I ever do justice when I'm so selfish? How can I ever love mercy when I love uh, you know, building myself up in comfort? How can I do that? Well, Jesus, <laughs> the Holy Spirit, says that he will crush sin's power over mm-hmm. you. He will crush your pride. He will right. crush your preference for comfort over love of neighbor. He will trample those things underfoot and defeat their power so that you can walk humbly with him so that you will do justice and you will actually in your heart love mercy. Mm -hmm. Um, Those things will bear out in your life. You will not be a fig tree with just leaves and no fruit. You will bear fruit. Yeah. Who is like God? Who is like God? Micah. That's what Micah means. That's Mm -hmm. so cool. Wow. Okay. Well, is that Micah? That's the book of Micah. All right. What's next up for us? Next week we'll be in the book of Nahum. Well, that's appropriate because it's next. It's it's next. <laughs> the reason why we're doing it next is because it's next. We're also filming it next in our timeline. Yep. Um, and it's really interesting because it is a partner book to the book of Jonah in many oh, ways. Right. The book of Jonah was about God's mercy towards Nineveh. The book of Nahum is about God's judgment against Nineveh. Mm, well... I'll be excited to dive into that. So, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us, and we will see you next week in Nahum. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next week.